The Bills come out on Tuesday morning and fire offensive coordinator Ken Dorsey after what was a heartbreaking loss to the Broncos. Drops Buffalo down to five and five on the outside looking in on the playoff picture. And we've talked about this a little bit with Diana when the news happened, but I wanted to talk with you sort of about the nuts and bolts that may have led to this or the nuts and bolts that maybe don't justify a move like this. So what just first and foremost, when this happened, when it came down, when you heard the news, what was your initial reaction? Well, the initial reaction was <clears throat> a little bit of shock because this just doesn't seem like a Buffalo bills team that you likes to make moves during the season. Then all of a sudden 10 games in Leslie Frazier's not there. Who was their D corner last year. Right. Mm -hmm. And now Ken Dorsey's not there who was their offensive coordinator for the past two years. And so uh, it's been a little bit uh, it, like I, I was working out actually, and it came through on my phone and somebody texted me. I go, wait, what? Because when I watched the game, um, I don't watch it as a fan. Okay. I watch it as like, I'm in the room game planning and I'm trying to go through the plays that I see on how I would read it, if that makes sense. So sure. it's, it's a little bit weird. And honestly, it's a very mentally taxing for me. Um, <laughs> so I can't really, I can't really like enjoy it. Cause I'm always, you know, not a critical eye, but I'm always like, okay, well, all right, I see what he did there. And it's just like, it takes me like you 30 seconds. You can't passively and I'm already... watch it. You're actively no. watching it the entire time. Yes. I understand that. I don't, and, I, I don't have the capacity to do that, but I understand yeah. a tiny fraction of what that feels like. It, well, and then also it's like, not only that, now this, this was a standalone game, but think about when you got eight early game windows and you got four on each screen <laughs> and you're just like, oh my, you know, so it's anyway. So anyway, yeah, I was working out and I was in shock because when I was watching the game, I didn't think other than the turnovers, things look that bad. Like just watching it live, right? Like obviously, obviously you can't turn the ball over and win. And that has been without a doubt the biggest problem of Josh Allen's entire career. This is nothing new. He, since he came in the league in 2018, he leads the league in turnovers, and it's by a high margin. It's not even close. And um, so I went in, and I just rewatched it. I literally, like 20 minutes ago, and I thought the exact same thing watching it. It didn't look that bad. Like, it didn't look like they were out of sync. I mean, of course, there were some pass protection issues early in the game, the, I mean, the fumble on the first play of the game and almost interception on the second play of the game. I was like, oh, man, like this is not a good start. Now, you, you, I do take that the the Denver Broncos defense. OK, they had five take they, they had five takeaways against you know the Chiefs and then they had four. This so they have nine takeaways in the last two games. So maybe they found something there. But I at the end of the day, and I say all this, I, I just think that. Sean McDermott needed somebody to fall on the sword. And that somebody, unfortunately, was was Dorsey. And and I don't I don't think it was I don't think the move was warranted, if that makes sense. Like watching them play, I don't think that the move was warranted at all. When this stuff happens, this stuff typically happens with teams that are embarrassing. Teams that are truly like the worst performing teams in the NFL, where you need to pull the plug in season because that's how bad it's gotten. Right now, today, the Buffalo Bills rank third in offensive DVOA so far this year. Over And if you want to split it up into halves, let's say the first five games and the second five games, yeah. over the last five games, they lead the NFL in offensive success rate. The amount of their plays that are successful, they are number one. OK, so and I know that that's been parroted by a bunch of different people all week that, yeah. man, look at all these metrics about the Bills offense. How could you possibly fire a guy that is overseeing something like this? I want to go a little bit deeper than that, because I do think that maybe there are some underlying issues that are worth digging into. But that's why it was so surprising for me, because yeah. they've they have not drop to the level of a team that typically makes a decision like this. Usually you fire a guy 10 weeks into the year because you just can't go on any longer at yeah. this pace. And that's not how the bills feel. It just felt like, like you said, somebody needs to kind of take the brunt of them being this far away from the yeah. team that they want to be in the standings and performance wise. So I get it. If you look at some of the numbers a little bit deeper, we can dig into this. So right now, Everything has stayed pretty much consistent over the last five weeks compared to the first five. The one thing that's changed is the amount of turnovers that are happening. They are turning the ball over on the highest percentage of their drives in the NFL. It's been 
over the last five weeks. Wow. But that my question is turnover variance and a couple weird fumbles. Is that the reason you should fire your offensive coordinator when your offense is otherwise playing at least okay? Even if you have some issues with it, even if it's a little bit uneven, it still feels like this is a drastic decision when you look at the overall results of what they've put on the field so far this year. I think it definitely wasn't warranted. And I think the reason was because if you look at turnovers, right? Like how often is coaching that has to do with the turnovers zero. It's like a guy fumbles. Okay. Is that, is that the coach's fault? No. All right. Maybe if it wasn't coached correctly high into, okay, but you can't at the end of the day, it's players, not plays. And so if the plays weren't working, which certainly they were based on the numbers you just said, they're number one in the, in, in offense in that category, the last five games, then to fire a guy like this, it, it makes me believe that, it's a much deeper issue. It's not just the on the field um, turnovers. I mean, a fifth of their drives the last five games, you're telling me 22% are turnover worth. Like that's wild to me. That's a very high number. That is no way, shape or form what you want to do, but you can only do so much as a coach. And so when you look at this, maybe six weeks, if we go back six weeks, uh, like in the future, okay? And we go back and look at this time right now. I guarantee you, you won't sit there and say, oh, you know, Joe Brady made this offense so much better. Like it's just- I, it, I think that might it. happen though, because I, I think I the turnovers may normalize and yeah. they may just, they may start turning the ball over at an average rate. <laughs> yeah. Nothing else may change. <laughs> and then because they got better, everyone will say, well, they fired Ken Dorsey. That was what they needed to do. When in yeah. reality, it was probably always going to get better because the turnovers to a certain extent, the decision-making and him pushing the ball into tight windows, that can get him in trouble sometimes. Yeah. But the fumbles and so much of the stuff that we've seen over the last couple of weeks is random shit. It, it's random. stuff that will not continue to happen. So I absolutely can see a world where they go on a run, they start playing great on yeah. offense, and everyone says, oh man, they needed to make the change. When in reality, that has nothing to do with why they're playing better. And that's what I tend to say. It's like like anyone else that's looking out there and not digging in deep into the numbers like we are, they're going to say that. But they could do this with Dorsey at the helm. Like, that's what I don't understand. And 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 honestly, you could sort of, like, we should have all, like, of course, you saw it too, right when this news hit Twitter and X, like, it was the meme of Dorsey just slamming the, <laughs> the, the surface down and freaking out. Or like, oh, we should have known then that, you know, he was going to be fired. And it was a funny meme, but, like, I just think at the end of the day, I, I don't necessarily think, it's hard to tell now that he's fired, but I don't necessarily think that him and Sean McDermott saw maybe eye to eye on maybe strategy or game planning or use of personnel or, you know, under like, cause, cause when I did watch the first half in the first half is really when they struggled, they got a little bit better throughout the game. There was no under center runs. There was no under center play action. And then finally they were just like, hand the damn ball off. Like let Murray, let cook, Eat and they ran for probably I don't know, I don't even know how many yards were I didn't check the stats but they ran for a lot of yards like Cook was Cook was over 100 Tavis Murray had a hell of a game and it's like that's what Josh Allen needs when he's in a little bit of a funk like the interception Josh threw the first one tipped okay like all right like it was it was open and should have like there were six drop passes in the game like you're gonna put that on Josh like people don't understand like the completion okay there was I counted six and in, in, in the out route to the field he was late. Footwork was awful. He sh he hitched one too many times. He left it inside. Bad throw. Okay, so one bad throw and then a slipped handoff. Like people, because because I got it. Oh, he had, I the, got he had it. the other one that should have been picked off on the second yeah, drive that yeah, was not yeah. where the, should, the linebacker well, should have had it. He, he got he lucky. Some bit. chances in that game he didn't need to, but yeah. I think people are going to look at that game as emblematic of Josh Allen's season to this point. It's not. He has the lowest turnover worthy play rate of his career. Everyone has that Jets game deep in their minds where he threw three interceptions and everyone's going to have this game in their minds. Yeah. And that's understandable in between those two games. He actually has not put the ball in harm's way that often he's thrown a couple picks, but that's going to happen when you have his play style. So I think overall, yeah. again, I don't know if what happened on Monday night was necessarily representative of what the bills offense has been to that point. And I think you're making a decision based on a game. And even if it's a couple games where the randomness of some of these turnovers is probably going to come back to earth a little but yeah and i just at the end of the day someone had to fall on the sword right like like is it is it sean mcdermott trying to be like hey 
Like I'm trying to say my job, I'm not saying he's going to get fired or anything like that, but like, is it that move to like, Hey, Joe Brady, we saw what he could do in college had a little bit of uh, he's and, and that's, that's the thing about Joe Brady. It's like, people don't understand. He, he got fired halfway through the season. Okay. By, by rule and they didn't see eye to eye so is this going to be his chance like that's that's lost in this whole thing because his his name the last two years has been in head coaching cycles like he's yeah. gotten a ton of interviews and and i could see something where hey he gets he gets a shot here and they go on a little run they make a deep run of the playoffs it's like okay you know quarterback now you're oc all right we want to be full-time OC. he's going to get back into the head coaching cycle and um yeah i mean look and what i was going to say is I got a lot of people like, hey, is Josh Allen broken? Is Josh Allen broken? I'm like, no. In fact, and I said exactly what you said. He's playing some of the best ball in his career. And I even think the Jets game, minus those three turnovers, like he played pretty dang good against a really good defense. And so the fact of the matter is they're five and five. They're in full-on freakout mode in Buffalo right now because this was a team, if you talked about them at the beginning of the season, it was they were in the top three conversation in the AFC. Like it was just, that's just how it was. And then you look and you start doing, and it's deeper on this offense on the struggles. It's like, Hey, why didn't Stefan Diggs get in the ball? Why don't you have a run game? Why don't you have an, like, and so all this, I expect to change. And at the end of the day, like you said, the turner turnovers will normalize and, and they might, they could go on a run here. Although they have like the toughest schedule. Well, that's up, the right? problem Anyone. is the, the yeah. schedule they're staring down as part of this issue is that oh they have gosh. such an uphill battle with the teams that they're playing. But there's so many things that maybe you could tweak some things here and there, right? Josh is up near the top of the league in the amount of RPO attempts he has this season. If you have a quarterback who's maybe trying to push it a little bit too hard, maybe you just line up and run the ball a little bit more often. Take that out of his hands. Yeah. So Stuff like that. But I don't think those are wholesale changes. I think those are small mm -hmm. tweaks that you can make over the course of the year. And to Dorsey's credit, they had been doing a lot more of that stuff during his tenure than they had toward the end of the Brian Ta Brian Dable time there. They had under center runs. They were using heavier personnel yeah. more often. I think they were trying to figure out some of this stuff. They had gone to less under center play action over the last couple of games compared to what they did earlier in the season, but they still had that element of the offense. I feel like they were poking and prodding for some answers and yeah. it, it just is unfortunate that the turnovers got so bad over the last couple of weeks that ultimately I think that's what does him in. Yeah. And I think, I think what you're going to see in Joe Brady, I mean, like I was with him for two years in the saints when he was an offensive, like quality control guy, like when he was first starting out mm -hmm. and he was always, always like a bright mind, innovative offense. So it's not like you're going to see wholesale changes within the offense with him, because let's face it, you're 10 weeks in, you are who you are. But you will see maybe a different strategy of how you implement it, on how you coach it, on how um, maybe Josh Allen has a little bit more say in the offense and what he likes and what he feels comfortable with. They're going to go back and fully self-scout. I guarantee you they're already doing it right now. The past 10 games, hey, what are we really good at? What are our weaknesses? Okay, let's just do more of what we're really good at. We got something in Murray and Cook. Let's lean on that. And they're playing decent defense too. But like you said, it's it's the schedule from hell almost coming up. I mean, it's like the third toughest schedule to finish the year. So you're going to learn a lot about the Buffalo Bills here in the next six or seven weeks. Was there anything about the structure of the passing game that you felt was lacking or you felt was putting too much on the quarterback? Because there are some people who really study this team closely, you know, Bills fans, people that are looking at this offense, just saying, you know, there are so many op times where there's nothing coming back into his vision when he has to come off his first read. It's, uh, there's so many things outside the numbers. You're putting so much on the players to win some of these one-on-ones and so much on your quarterback in terms of the difficulty of this stuff. Do you feel like there are certain things that they could lean into a little bit more to maybe make things a little bit easier on Josh specifically. Yeah, what I'd like to see him do, and, and they did a little bit of it, not a ton, is just more pure progression plays. And what does that mean? It just means, hey, Josh, look, here, if he's open, throw it. If not, throw to this guy. If not, take off and run. Like, Josh isn't one to sit in the pocket and get through three progressions. He's never played like that. And quite honestly, that's what his stinger is. It's one, two, go. And when he goes, it's either really good and he's running and they're, they're balling out, or two, he's running to throw. Um, the football and to buy time. And that's what makes him special, in my opinion. He's never going to be a guy that sits back there and goes one, two, three, four, right? So I would almost like sort of what they're doing in, in, in Denver right now. It's like, hey, hey, Russ, one, two, take off. Like, like simplify it for the guy. And what I did see is a little bit more of like, hey, this side, 
uh, in two by two formation, you're going to throw this versus cover two. This side in two by two, you're going to throw in cover three. You're going to get to a man. That's too much thinking for Josh yeah. at the line. Like he didn't, and I did see a lot of that, and and I, I get it, but that's that's sort of what good offenses do. You have to be able to trust your quarterback. Hey, you you can't just give him a pure progression on everything because everything's not going to just be open. But I do think that there needs to be more under center play action shots, and that's when you can get the pure progressions. Now, quick game, I get it. Give me a quarters answer on this side. Give me a cover three answer on this side. And if it's man, then I can check to something. Like, yeah, you can live on that 20% of your game plan. But when you do it a little bit more than that, it just puts a lot on your plate. And that's sometimes, honestly, like that's sometimes with RPOs because there's a lot that goes in on a quarterback's plate for an RPO. It's like, and, and honestly, Josh had uh, a couple zone reads he misread in this game and just kept them. And so if you're doing zone reads where the quarterback's having to read, you're doing RPOs where the quarterback's having to read an end and then a second level defender and then decide, hey, am I throwing this slant or the outside slant? Like there's almost such thing as like there's no plays off mentally for a quarterback. And people are thinking, well, he should be on every play. Well, there's something to be just said, hey, under center, just hand the ball off and go naked fake. Like give me a break, like truly. And there's none of that for Josh right now. It's so funny that you say that because that's exactly what I was going to say is that a lot of coaches I've talked to specifically that kind of come yes. from that, you know, Kubiak, Stefanski kind of under center world. The thought is, I just want to give him a couple plays off every once in a while. And that was in regard to Kyler Murray coming into this season with Arizona. It's yeah. that if you looked at what he had to do within that old offense for the Cardinals, he's on every single play. Yeah. At the very least, if you just line up under center and run the ball or even use some play action where Blue, it's yeah, defined. bootleg it's, is what I was it's gonna defined. Say. It's yes. defined. You don't have to worry about everything that you have to read out. Yeah. It's like, yes. all right, I'm going to get to the top of my drop. It's one, it's two, it's check down. And they only ran three yeah. under center play action plays in that game. And they didn't use a lot of under center running the ball. So we'll see yeah. what happens. The other thing, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole on this. We spent a lot of time on it, but the, the footwork thing that you mentioned is interesting because I remember talking to Joe Brady a couple summers ago and discussing kind of the, some of the light bulb moments when coming into that staff and how they do things. And I've always joked about this, that a lot of the Bill's offense is no rules, just vibes. And <laughs> when you watch some of his footwork within that offense, that's how it is. Yeah. Like he's just kind of feeling stuff out and playing a little bit off schedule. And that's a feature, not a bug of what they do offensively. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if maybe if you change the coordinator, you have somebody come in who maybe hadn't come from that world with Dable when they were putting all of this stuff in. Is there a path where maybe you tighten some of that stuff up a little bit? Maybe you change that just a little bit to maybe play a little bit more on time in control than they've done so far. Because it, I think it lends to Josh's st play style and his skill yeah. set, but I think it also can make him feel a little unsettled at times. Yeah, and I think that's probably the number one thing that that Brady's going to have to to do. And he and it's not like, hey, you're going to go in there and have some serious conversation with Josh Allen because Josh Allen is still, in my opinion, top five quarterback in the league. Like that, I that's said, he was I said he was the MVP of the league last week, and I I yeah. believed it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And so it's like, it's, it's not like he's broken. It's just like, Hey, you might have a little chat. Hey man, like, what do you like to do? All right. Let's just clean this footwork up a little bit. Like, let's get you more quick game. Let's get you more uh, uh, pure progression. Let's get you on the move. Like go take off bro. Because when you use your legs, we're a better offense. All those subtle changes can add up to be a big explosion of offense, depending on who you're playing and how the game planning aspect, that's what a lot of people understand. The game planning aspect of it could completely change on who's involved with saying, okay, we have 50 plays on the whiteboard for the Denver Broncos, say last week. We need to get this 50 down to 25, okay? Yep. You got 10, 10 quick game. You got three or four five-step. You got three or four seven-step. You got 12 play action, you got some screens and that's, that's the game plan. And then we'll go to get on the third down later. So I think that is going to change and that's going to be interesting to see when it's going to be impossible to know unless some reporter gets in and, and figures it out. But it, I think it'll, I think that's the biggest change you'll see is who's involved in the game planning and play design process. I will say that watching them, and, and this is just my untrained eye watching them, it kind of does feel like that a little bit. Like it doesn't feel quite as cohesive and kind of building on itself as some of the other really good offenses that we see in the league. 
Yeah, it, 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 I, I would say that that is correct. It, it's a little bit random. It's a little bit picking from everything. And some, like like I said, that can get in the quarterback's head a lot. It's like, hey, tell me who we are, and let's just let's major in that. Like a couple of years ago, when we were struggling running the football in LA, it was like, okay, on bye week, we said, hey, we're doing way too much stuff. Let's run duo and let's run gap schemes and major in that ten different ways, rather than like inside zone, outside zone, gap scheme. Uh, do a, like all these things and sometimes s like s simple is better and um like, like everyone you said keep it keep it simple stupid like that's the truth like you don't have to do all this crazy stuff uh just execute what you have